Hello GCSE students, welcome to this video on the opening stage directions to an inspector course. Uh, without further ado, let's get to it. So, the cast list, as it were, the character list to be more accurate, is quite informative and we shouldn't overlook it. At uh, the top there, the head of the family, the patriarch, is Arthur Burling. Uh, and then everybody else follows his lead, as it were. They are all possessions of the father. Sybil Burling is his wife. Sheila Burling is his daughter. Eric Burling is his son. So ownership, possession, superiority, all of these things are being conveyed right at the beginning of the text. After that, we have Edna. Uh, who is she? She's just the maid. Uh, her title is all she has. No surname, just a job title, maid. Then we have Gerald Croft and Inspector Gould. And I'm sure your teachers will have covered the sort of various significances of the surname Gould. Sounds like Gould, as in a ghost, G-H-O-U-L, um, and could have implications and insinuations as to what his role is in the text. We're then told all three acts, which are continuous, take place in the dining room of the Burlings house, uh, the apostrophe's in the wrong place there, in Brumley, a made up city, but an industrial city in the North Midlands. So north of Birmingham, perhaps, somewhere like that. Uh, it is an evening in spring 1912. And the evening in spring is said to be uh, the night on which the Titanic uh, sank. Why is it set on that particular night? Well. The theory goes that the Titanic was perhaps the embodiment of Edwardian uh, grandeur and wealth. What happened to the Titanic? It sank and in sinking, Priestley could be making the point that Edwardian grandeur uh, needed to be toppled. Is the inspector the iceberg? Um, I'm not so sure. That's something that examiners have seen over the years. The inspector is the metaphorical iceberg who topples the Burling family. Um, the problem with that as an interpretation, uh, I think, is that the inspector is an active force who appears to go out of his way to topple, to use that word again, the Burling family, and the iceberg was no such thing, it's just an inanimate object. Um, so if you decide to go down that route of using it, just be mindful um, that it is only, a, I think, a, a fairly tenuous, not the strongest interpretation. The stage directions themselves are here. Act one, the dining room of a fairly large suburban house belonging to a prosperous manufacturer. It has good solid furniture of the period. The general effect is substantial and heavily comfortable, but not cozy and homelike. If a realistic set is used, then it should be swung back as it was in the production at the new theater. By doing this, you can have the dining table centered downstage during act one when it is needed there and then swinging back reveal the fireplace for act two and then for act three can show a small table with a telephone on it downstage of the fireplace and by this time the dining table and chairs have moved well upstage. Producers who wish to avoid this tricky business which involves two resettings of the scene and some very accurate adjustments of the extra flats necessary would be well advised to dispense with an ordinary realistic set if only because the dining table becomes a nuisance. The lighting should be pink and intimate until the inspector arrives, and then it should be brighter and harder. At Rise of Curtain, four Burlings and Gerald are seated at the table, with Arthur Burling at one end, his wife at the other, Eric downstage, and Sheila and Gerald seated upstage. Edna, the parlour maid, is just clearing the table, which has no cloth, of the dessert plates and champagne glasses, etc., and then replacing them with decanter of port, cigar box, cigarettes. Port glasses are already on the table. All five are in evening dress of the period, the men in tails and white ties, not dinner jackets. Arthur Burling is a heavy looking, rather portentous man in his middle fifties, with fairly easy manners, but rather provincial in his speech. His wife is about fifty, a rather cold woman, and her husband's social superior. Sheila is a pretty girl in her early twenties, very pleased with life, and rather excited. 
Gerald Croft, is an attractive chap, about 30, rather too manly to be a dandy, but very much the well-bred young man about town. Eric is in his early 20s, not quite at ease, half shy, half a At the moment, they have all had a good dinner, are celebrating a special occasion, and are pleased with themselves. Right. Um, why do teachers uh, invariably spend quite a lot of time on these stage directions? Well, the answer to that question is that Priestley leaves a trail of clues for us to follow. And as we proceed through the text and watching the play, um, we see how some of the clues that are laid here um, are built upon and dealt with really as, as, we, as we watch. So let's, let's go through it and we'll do this reasonably quickly. So it's a, it's a fairly large suburban house. It's not a mansion, it's not a row of terraces, it's fairly large um, and that may hint at the Burling sort of middle class status. They're not the obscenely rich, but they're very comfortable, thank you very much. Um, the suburbs, the, you know, the outskirts of a city, were once upon a time the places where those who had wealth would choose to live. Um, still do really. You choose to live in the suburb because of its location which enables you to commute back into those urban centres, but the urban centres might be overpopulated, uh, busy, and so to move to the suburb is, is perhaps a sign of people who have wealth, who have means, who are choosing to uh, park themselves um, in a place where other like-minded people live. Um, we're told that it, the house belongs to a prosperous manufacturer, and so um, we're being told there about Mr. Burling. He's a wealthy man. The furniture of the period, well, it's 1912, and the period is the Edwardian period, and uh, we're therefore being told that they have enough money to buy good, expensive furniture of 1912. But that may also suggest that this is furniture which is not antique. These are not heirlooms passed down from generation to generation. Um, and as such, perhaps the Burling family are new money. They are the nouveau riche, that French word which uh, captures the essence of the Burlings, really. They are not landed, they have not got titles like Lord and Lady Croft, perhaps. Um, they haven't always belonged to this particular social group. And we see how throughout the text there are these hints that the Burlings are inferior to people like the Crofts and how they desire to become part of that social group. After all, the marriage between Gerald and Sheila is seen by Mr. Burling as uh, an opportunity to climb that greasy social ladder. In the brackets, we have a series of quite detailed instructions from J.B. Priestley telling uh, directors and producers how they may put on the show, how they may stage an Inspector Calls. Um, there are a couple of details in it that are particularly helpful and they're mainly towards the end of that paragraph. And it surrounds the lighting. The lighting should be pink and intimate. Again, your teachers I'm sure will have picked up on the idea of the pink being suggestive of love, of warmth, maybe how the Burlings are inclined to see the world through these uh, rather cliched now, rose-tinted spectacles. <clears throat> but then, of course, the inspector arrives, and when he arrives, we're told that it should be brighter and harder. Now, if the pink light gets brighter and harder, does it go white or does it go red? And um, there are two possible interpretations there. And the job of a successful student really is to identify that both of those interpretations have validity and to say them both if it's appropriate for whatever question comes up. So if we are saying that it's a white light, we can articulate that Priestley suggests that the inspector arrives and shines a light on the Burling family. He highlights their imperfections. He puts the spotlight onto the Burling family. Um, if we twist that on its head a little bit, the white light could be symbolic 
and suggestive of a torch and how the inspector is searching for answers. If, however, we say that the light becomes a red light when the inspector arrives, it becomes a brighter, harder red light, then perhaps the red light is suggestive of warning. It's suggesting of, suggestive of danger. Um, and as I said, a successful student typically acknowledges all of the different interpretations available. Either way, the pink light at the beginning is revealing because it ties into the other clue at the top of the paragraph. The general effect of their home is substantial and heavily comfortable, but not cosy and homelike. This is a family who put on a pretense, a front, a veneer, all those words meaning the same thing really. Um, there is the pretense of happiness, the pretense of contentedness, but just beneath the surface there is discord. Um, and we'll see that as we proceed through the text. So that pink light maybe implies that things are cosy, but like the furniture, things are not cosy. The family are not the tight unit that they wish to appear. And Priestley is deliberately constructing the Burlings in this way. As we move down to the final paragraph of this particular presentation, there are again numerous clues. At the rise of the curtain, the Burlings and Gerald are seated at the table. So we have Mr. Burling at one end of the table. We have Mrs. Burling at the other end of the table. We have Patriarch, Mr. Burling, Matriarch, Mrs. Burling, male head of the household, Patriarch, female head of the household, Matriarch. They are the figureheads of the family and their seating positions convey that to us. Maybe some of you have something similar uh, in your houses where mum, dad, whoever the boss is, sits at the head of the table. Um, it's a way of conveying seniority and higher status. Of course, if you have a round table, then it may imply a measure of equality. Um, it's a more socialist way of looking at things, is it not? Uh, where everyone sits equally with no seniority and no hierarchy. If we continue that theme, Eric is sat downstage. Eric is sat furthest away from the audience. Why? Well, perhaps Eric has the most to conceal. Um, after all, we will discover that Eric's crimes are real crimes. He has done things that you can be punished for in a court of law. He steals money. So in addition to Eric's moral crimes of oh, where to begin, how he treats uh, Eva Smith, uh, his discarding of her, the suggestion of um, sexual assault and, and all the rest really, Eric has the most to conceal. If we move on, Edna, the maid, uh, that's all she is, just to reiterate, she's just the maid, the parlour maid, she's clearing the table. No cloth on that table, again, suggestive of a sort of lack of warmth, a lack of coziness. Um, and what does she do? She clears dessert plates and champagne glasses and replaces them with decanter of port. So um, fortified red wine, I believe port is, um, sweeter red wine, cigar box and cigarettes. This is illustrative of a celebration dessert plates, champagne glasses, uh, perhaps not what you'd have on a typical Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or even Saturday evening, or a Sunday, maybe, excuse me, losing my voice, um, maybe the kinds of things that are taken out for special occasions only. And we will see how throughout the course of the text, the Burlings are celebrating a special occasion. If we um, continue, all five are then are in evening dress of the period, the men in tails and white jet ties, not dinner jackets. Well, what is a dinner jacket? By modern standards, we might call it a tuxedo. You no know, black suit, stripes down the side of your trousers. God knows why I'm putting 
looking at my shoulder, but down the side of your trousers, um, bow tie, really quite formal. Um, but the Burling family and Gerald Croft, they have shunned the tuxedo. Uh, apparently a tuxedo is not grand enough to sit around in your own house and celebrate a special occasion. You must wear tails. What's a tail suit? It's a long sort of, we might call it a morning suit, like a penguin suit. Um, a blazer with a long back on it, which might stretch to just above the knee. Um, typically worn high days and holidays, you know, weddings. Um, if people go to Ascot, go to Ladies Day, posh day at the races, they might put on their finery. Um, but as I said there, the Burlings are sat in their own dining room wearing tails and white ties. Um, this is a special occasion. Maybe they're trying to impress someone. We know that Mr. Burling throughout the course of the text will be trying to impress Gerald Croft to make it clear that his daughter is a suitable choice for a, an aristocrat such as Gerald Croft, the son of Lord and Lady Croft, um, people with titles, people with money, yes, but more important, the title, um, the heritage that comes with being able to pass on a good name. We know that throughout the course of the text, Mr. Burling is very concerned with his reputation. Uh, he is very, very keen indeed to avoid a scandal. Arthur Burling, the man I just spoke of, is a heavy looking, he's fat, too indelicate a way to put it, but he's a bigger man, um, and maybe indicative of his wealth. He's a rather portentous man, uh, portentous, it, it, suggesting he likes the sound of his own voice, self-important, speaks of things in an ominous fashion. Uh, and we know he does this, you know, the Germans don't want war, he says. Um, the Titanic is unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. There are various clues which tell us that Mr. Burling is uh, something of a fool and his portentousness um, is a significant character flaw. He has easy manners, so he hasn't been brought up um, with a silver spoon in his mouth. He is not an aristocrat. He is not a member of the so-called upper classes. His manners give him away. The very first lines of the text after this tell us that. You know, Mrs. Burling rebukes Mr. Burling for telling, wanting to tell the cook the chef that dinner was very nice. You know, simply don't do those things like compliment people. How outrageous to compliment people and say nice things to them. An obvious sign of his easy manners. And uh, he's rather provincial in his speech. He doesn't speak the Queen's English. Um, he doesn't speak received pronunciation. These days we might some people consider the ability to speak standard English um, advantageous, uh, you know, a good thing. But Mr. Burling doesn't speak that because he's provincial. A province um, being um, a far-flung outpost of the UK. And uh, most of the versions that you watch depict Mr. Burling as having some kind of accent, whether it's up north or in theory, it should be from the Midlands. Uh, and my ability to do accents from the Midlands stretches to the ability to say the word Birmingham. So maybe he has a voice which goes up and down and it's telling us that he is not like Mrs. Burling. I've, I've kind of, my voice there has gone into sort of Liverpool and Manchester. I can't really do it. But Mrs. Burling is her husband's social superior. And so, the clue already is that she is of higher status than him, that she has, inverted commas, married down. And maybe that tells us why Mr. Burning is so keen to have Sheila marry up. By marrying Gerald Croft, she is improving her status, but also the status of the whole Burling family by mixing with people in the so-called upper echelons of Edwardian Britain. 
We shouldn't overlook, however, Mrs. Burling is a cold woman. And I've used the word warmth a number of times because Mrs. Burling is cold, like the house is cold, like the family is cold. And cold in this instance means uh, to have a lack of empathy, um, a lack of care and concern for other people. Sheila, what is she? She's a pretty girl, priestly defines her by her appearance. Um, and that's a pretty common trait throughout the text. Um, she's a girl, not a woman, not a young lady, a girl, telling us something about her youth and her naivety. Uh, at the beginning of the text, that is mainly a negative, but her youth will be come to seen, uh, will come to be seen as a positive over the course of the text, because with youth comes the ability to learn, and with youth comes the ability to change. And Sheila, we will see, is able to change for the better. She's pleased with life, she's rather excited. She's smug, and we don't like smugness. We're encouraged to dislike smugness uh, in Sheila. Gerald Croft, that so-called, well, he's, he's an aristocrat. What does it say about him? He's attractive. Oh, he's very desirable, is Gerald. Um, the kind of girl that, sorry, wrong way around, the kind of man that any girl would want. He's a bit older than Sheila. He's 30 in comparison to her early 20s. Um, there's this kind of hypocritical moral double standard that throughout the text, that is, that men are allowed to go off and sow their wild oats and fornicate with random women. Um, and that's what Gerald's been doing for the last 10 years of his life, presumably, off gallivanting um, with whoever it is takes his fancy. Gerald, because he's an aristocrat, can gallivant and fornicate with whomsoever he likes and there'll be very few repercussions. At least that's what it has always been like. And we will see again in the course of the text how Gerald's attractive dandiness, not quite dandiness, but his attractive manliness um, is desirable to the women of the town, um, leading to an affair with Daisy Renton. What else about Gerald? So he's too masculine to be a dandy, but he is very much the well-bred young man about town. And the, the, the words there is well-bred. Um, he has the appropriate manners that Mr. Burling doesn't. He has the warmth that Mrs. Burling lacks. With aristocracy comes grooming. Um, and I don't mean that in any kind of sinister sense. He's well groomed. He has been prepared and cultivated uh, and raised to be exactly the man that he is. In many respects, Gerald cannot escape his class. The point is, he doesn't want to because his class has given him so many advantages. Eric, by contrast, a uh, younger man, he's younger than Sheila, he's not quite at ease. He's uncertain, he's unsteady. He doesn't know who he is or what he is or how he's supposed to act. And of course, he is concealing the, the gravest, most serious secret of them all. And maybe this explains why he is half shy and half assertive. Where do we see Eric being half shy and half assertive? Well, the assertive is very easy. His first utterance in the play is to guffaw. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, stupid noise to guffaw, a sort of involuntary laugh. Uh, that's the first thing he says in the text. That's a sign of his assertiveness. When Eric is asked to sort of raise a glass to Sheila and Gerald and their engagement, uh, he's very assertive. You know, he says that she's got a nasty temper on her, but she's all right, really. However, Eric is very, very shy indeed. Um, he is we will see him speaking to Mr. Burling and Gerald uh, about women. Mr. Burling will have just said that women are potty about uh, clothes. And Eric will say, oh yes, I remember. Oh, I remember. And he stops himself before he gives too much away. And then all of a sudden he becomes very shy indeed. Eric doesn't remain shy because like Sheila, he is 
a member of the younger generation, the younger generation who represent the chance for a better future, the younger generation who learn from their mistakes, the younger generation who provide the best opportunity for a better world uh, in which to live for everybody else. So at the end of the text, they will be scared about how the adults talk, the older generation that is. Um, and they will take on the role of the inspector who, who will have um, made quite the impression on those young people. At the moment, love it, love that phrase, at the moment, oh look, there's another sledgehammer of a clue just to say, this moment won't last for too long, but at the moment, they have all had a good dinner, are celebrating a special occasion, and are pleased with themselves. And they will remain pleased with themselves until the inspector arrives to make them not pleased with themselves any longer. And it's a message that needs to be delivered forcefully and emphatically, for otherwise they will not learn their lesson. And we see that they will not learn their lesson at the end of the text, where the, we uh, learn of a phone call where the inspector will arrive, or a, an inspector will arrive to ask them some questions. Because until they learn from the error of their ways, uh, they're going to keep reliving their guilt over and over and over again. Hopefully this pushes you in the right direction uh, in reminding you of the beginning of an inspector calls and seeing those clues so that as you read and watch the rest of the text you can see these things uh, come to pass so hopefully a useful video and that's this video completed for now um just remains for me to say hope they're useful do subscribe watch the others and that's it thanks very much bye bye